Hello, good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, welcome to the uh, Atlantic Council. I am uh, Ramayad. I am the Senior Director of uh, the Atlantic Council's Africa Center, the Senior Fellow at the Europe Center. Um, it's my pleasure, uh, on behalf of the Freedom of and Prosperity Program, to uh, open this, uh, this new panel focused on the paradox of aid, forging the path forward in Africa. Um, and today, it's my uh, great pleasure to welcome our three uh, panelists. Um, William Esterly, uh, who is a professor of economics at New York University and co-director of the NYU Development Research Institute. Um, also, uh, Ray Hartley, uh, who is the research director of the Brent Hurst Foundation. Ray was an anti-apartheid activist in the United uh, Democratic Front and uh, covered the Nelson Mandela presidency, traveling the world with him uh, to testify about his, um, his journey. And Professor Robert Mudida, uh, who is the director of research of uh, the Central Bank of Kenya, and he was also a full uh, professor of political economy at Strathmore University Business School. Uh, he was also a director at the Institute for Public Policy and Governance at SBS. And you have been a visiting professor at uh, numerous universities from Switzerland to Benin, from Nigeria to Spain. Welcome uh, to all of you. The paradox of aid forging the path uh, forward in Africa, that is the tough issue um, we are going to cover today uh, in the next um, in the next, uh, yeah, 35, uh, 40 minutes. So I will start with you, William. Um, aid uh, in Africa does not seem to be very trendy these days or these past years. Um, can you remind us of the level of assistance provided to African countries uh, by their partners uh, and mostly um, uh, Western partners, and maybe you can say a few words about um, the assistance provided by the competitors, Chinese or Russians, for example. Sure. So I think the, the best way to put aid into perspective is to think about how aid compares to some market-based flows. So for Sub-Saharan Africa, let's think of the aid number on one hand, and then think on the other hand of the combined sum of exports from Africa remittances from African migrants back to Africa, and foreign direct investment into Africa. So the, the three of those I'm going to call market-based flows, those together amount to six times the amount of aid going into Africa. So there's a way in which a lot of our discussion about aid is paying just too much attention to aid. It's, we're making it more important than it, than it really is for Africa. The, most important thing for the growth and dynamism of Africa are these market-based flows, the opportunity to export the freedom of, of trade, somewhat restricted freedom of migrant, the freedom of, to invest in the African continent. These are the sort of most important drivers of Africa's uh, long-run future. The other thing that's very important about aid is the way in which it has sort of been doing the wrong things and going to the wrong places. So after after around the break point of about 2001 in the new millennium, if you compare aid flows before that point and after that point, the 20 years after that point, the most striking thing about that is that the, the countries that received the most aid were precisely the least free countries. If you rank all the aid recipients of the world into the most free and least free according to sort of widely accepted measures of political and economic freedom, the least free fourth of countries got an aid increase after 2001, up continuing through the 20-year period since then, of 300%. The other three quarters of the countries got an aid increase on the order of 40%. And speaking of annual average aid received by these countries. So it seems like if, aid, if, if we think of economic and political freedom as the key to Africa's development, somehow aid was not going into the support of, of those freer countries adopting those, those freer strategies for long-run prosperity. Why was that? It's probably because aid is very often driven by things that are frankly not about kind of altruism or the, the commitment to development success. They're about things that are more to do with US or UK foreign policy, such as after 2001, the obvious thing going on was uh, giving aid to, ally, to states that were allies in the war on terror. So for example, Uganda was a a big aid recipient, 
Um, Museveni in Uganda was a big ally of the war on terror and helping you know, fight al-Shabaab forces in Somalia and, and uh, cooperating with the war on terror in other, other places. That's a great example. So uh, an autocratic regime that did not allow freedom but was receiving a lot of aid support for probably for mainly those, those reasons. So we have, have this picture that uh, aid uh, is sort of not supporting freedom, but the sort of reassuring thing is uh, the sort of fate of the world does not depend on the bumbling efforts of, of aid officials, including myself as a former, former aid official. Uh, the fate of the world is much more in the hands of, of homegrown economic reformers that actually did achieve a lot of great things in Africa, which we can talk about more in the, in the second round. That is probably a lot more to do with Africa's uh, long-run future than than aid. What's going on with aid? Yeah. How how do you um, how do you um, explain um, uh, why Africans are um, more reluctant to aid? Because we know why is the motives uh, from Western countries, partners. But what about Africans? How how do you assess their willingness to receive this aid? Uh, why aid is less popular uh, now from the African perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think you can understand from what some of us just been talking, what we were just talking about, that uh, aid has this strongly paternalistic flavor that is sort of exaggerating. We, we aid donors are sort of greatly exaggerating our own importance and trying to impose our, our own solutions on, on Africa. Mm -hmm. And that comes across as very, very paternalistic, which of course, you know, intersects with these ridiculous campaigns in the West that were things like, you know, the Do They Know It's Christmas campaigns that went back to the Ethiopian famine of, of the 80s that has been perpetually renewed with a new rock concert every 10 years or so to, for the purpose of supposedly raising awareness about poverty in Africa, but often perpetrating a very insulting, condescending, paternalistic view toward, towards Africa as a, a place full of victim, helpless victims waiting for Western mm -hmm. rescue. You know, that's this sort of appalling, you know, that's not the viewpoint inside the more serious aid community, but that's sort of the, the message that goes out there into the Western public that is so important to raise support for aid, but unfortunately also raises support for very ill-designed ill uh, military interventions by the West into Africa and in general sort of paternalistic dictates to Africa that understandably a lot of Africans uh, protest against that sort of pa mm. paternalistic condescension. You know, the, the famous phrase of the Nigerian writer Teju Cole about the white savior industrial complex, you know, that sort of puts it all into that. And there is this African proverb that says, uh, the hands that gives is always uh, um, 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 uh, behind the, the, the hand that receives, you know? Yes, So yes. this is uh, exactly this. Uh, um, Professor uh, Robert Mudida, you have uh, an important experience, a big, an important experience in Africa from Kenya to, to Nigeria. So you know from the ground how aid is, is, uh, is received. So can you, can you just um, tell us um, more about the way uh, or how you assess the outcomes of the policy of the aid policy to African countries, is it uh, compatible with uh, freedom and prosperity uh, for Africans? And what um, um, what does it look like of an, effic an efficient financial assistance to Africans? Okay, thanks a lot for that question, and thanks a lot for having me. I think um, the subject of aid is a complex one, mm -hmm. so. Um, just to start off, I would say that, that uh, aid can certainly not solve all of Africa's problems because Africa's problems are multifaceted. It, it works better in certain circumstances, and I would say it's worked better in countries where you've had uh, more inclusive institutions in, in, in the context of, of uh, this particular conference. I think where you've had uh, more inclusive political and economic institutions, then you find aid has had more of an impact. In countries that have been less economically and politically free, then you find also aid uh, probably hasn't uh, had as much impact as it could have. So I think the question of, of uh, freedom is a very central one and, and definitely impacts aid considerably. Mm -hmm. Where you have better institutions, then aid has tended to work better. Mm -hmm. So you'd need to go to, to country experiences to be able to see that. 
and, and to see where it's had more of an impact, less of an impact. But I think the institutional variable is, is very critical. And what about the, because it's very, it can be, it, people may think that it's very simple to consider it as a whole. Um, maybe if we dive into the details, uh, we can have um, a different assessment. Uh, how do you appreciate uh, grants, loans, for example? Uh, is it the same kind of aid, or is it different in terms of efficiency? And 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 secondly, um, uh, aids is everywhere. You know, um, climate change, water, education, uh, health. What sector uh, should be uh, prioritized, or where the the needs are the most pressing, according to you? Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot for that question. I think again, it's, I, I think again it, it, it depends on, on, on two critical things. Mm -hmm. One is of course the amount of aid and how it's helping to, to fill critical gaps in African economies because what aid does, aid helps to fill uh, the gap between savings and investment. And if you look at many African countries, for example, the average savings rate as a percentage of GDP is about 11%. And yet they need, you know, to uh, to have sustainable long-term growth. You need about 25 to 30 percent of GDP. You need to be able to generate that kind of investment for it to be sustainable. So I think it's very uh, it's 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 very critical uh, to look at the gaps being filled in many African countries as well. At the moment, they are struggling in, in, in a fiscal sense. Mm -hmm. You find as well, uh, uh, let's say, revenues that are raised, uh, again, uh, you know, would be about 17% of GDP. You need about close to 30% of GDP if you compare by the standards of other emerging markets to be able to do sufficient things. And then very importantly also is, is uh, the conditionalities attached mm -hmm. to this aid as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think that's a very crucial component. To, so when you're talking of loans, uh, loans are helpful in the sense that they probably make you more accountable because you know you have to repay them. Mm -hmm. But also that increases indebtedness. But also there has to be some flexibility, as, as Bill was saying, to be able to come up with homegrown solutions. So how much flexibility do the loans allow you as well to come up with enduring solutions for the problems that you face? Mm -hmm. Grants are attractive, of course, mm -hmm. uh, because of the highly concessional nature. Mm -hmm. But the problem is then you can become too dependent on them. And then you might not address root causes of some of the problems. Mm -hmm. So I think ultimately what's important, beyond the question of whether they are loans and grants, is whether the aid is helping to create an environment for, uh, you know, for uh, long-term development. Mm -hmm. I think we need to move beyond aid. For example, in Africa's uh, case, it's, it's very central for many countries to reorient towards, for example, more trade, more trade rather than just aid, because aid creates a certain dependence. So more trade opportunities. So, uh, for example, in, in recent years, we've launched the African Continental Free Trade Area. And I think potentially, if, if, if that works well, then that can create tremendous opportunities in critical sectors in Africa like manufacturing and services. Mm -hmm. That is important on the one hand. I think on the other hand, also what's very important is that we're, we're innovating more, that we're enhancing productivity. Because if you look at struggles in many of Africa's sectors, they have to do with issues of innovation. Mm -hmm. So if aid helps, in a sense, to be able to, to enhance innovation in different ways, then I think it's useful. If it's not helping to, uh, African countries to innovate more, to become more productive, then it can become a drawback. Mm -hmm. There are certain types of aid, even beyond loans and grants, there are certain types of aid that I think generally are very helpful and these are the ones that focus on capacity building, provided they are properly tailored. So you find World Bank and IMF programs, for example, often uh, beyond the traditional components have a capacity building component. Mm -hmm. And that capacity building component often centers on innovation and productivity issues.
countries. Mm -hmm. And so that is very central. Yeah, we'll come back to, um, to, to more um, of, of that uh, later. If you allow me uh, to give the mic to Ray and um, ask about um, the, 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 the way we link aid, financial assistance, and the uh, democratic nature of regimes, or not. Because uh, the question is, should Western financial assistance to African countries be linked, or any country, be linked to political support, mm -hmm. uh, to democratic values, for example? Um, because uh, this is something that is in every mouth um, in policymakers, uh, in, in Western policymakers' uh, mouths. But in the meantime, we uh, cannot ignore the trade-off that exists between providing assistance, security, and aid to regimes that do not have a great democratic practice. So, um, how, in, in the interest of stability, how do you um, how do you appreciate that? What is your opinion about this trade-off between uh, aid and um, I don't know politics? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it absolutely is linked, whether whether or not you would like it to be linked. So, for example. The environment into which you pour a vast amount of money determines very much how that money ends up being used in, in that society. And in closed authoritarian societies, the outcome is, is, is likely to be far less effective mm. than an open, accountable, democratic society where there'd be checks and balances. And if there was corruption, there might be prosecutions, there might be legal recourse for the for the donor and for the, the beneficiaries who are not benefiting uh, might be able to take up, take up the, the, the case. In, in these closed societies, pouring the money in often is really just handing it over for redistribution by the, the, the authoritarian government. And they would then use that to extend their patronage network. Uh, and very often the beneficiaries on the ground are not necessarily those who are in the best position or best able to use that money, but are politically connected and end up uh, really just abusing those funds to some extent. Not in all cases. I think there are aid agencies that have strategies to, to counteract that, where they have very strong relationships directly with the recipients, and they then monitor very closely how that uh, how that is working and take action if they see there's, there's a problem or else withdraw. Mm -hmm. But I do think there is, I think it's usually approached from the point of view of you need to encourage democratic practices by rewarding mm -hmm. governments that are democratic. I think that, that there is a case for that. Mm -hmm. But more than that, uh, simply because you need the outcomes to be maximized. Mm -hmm. So how much of this flow of, of resources is actually going into something real on the ground? Um, you have a great experience uh, from South Africa. Um, from the South African point of view, how do you appreciate the paradox of aid? Yeah, I think that uh, in the South African environment, I think if there are some very interesting cases. Mm -hmm. I think one of the uh, most successful aid interventions that's been made was PEPFAR, which was the uh, US government's um, uh, uh, aid to assist with fighting HIV AIDS in South Africa. And you know, the metric there is very clear. You just need to look at South Africa's life expectancy graph. Mm -hmm. And you can literally see the change from the moment that this aid arrived and the upward swing. Mm -hmm. But I think that money was put into an environment where there was a lot of accountability, um, a lot of public debate and discussion, including in Parliament, uh, about how this money would be used. And it was a society where uh, you had a very uh, vibrant and active civil society that was, in fact, engaged with this issue and had applied a great deal of political pressure onto the government to deal with this uh, um, HIV AIDS problem um, that was then vigilant and able to watch and ensure that those resources went to very effective outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a targeted uh, uh, aid intervention made in a society where there is a, a vibrant uh, independent civil society that's able to monitor it, 
um, and where you have clear metrics that show you the outcome mm -hmm. working. So in that environment, I think you... And yet, uh, South Africa is, uh, this very South Africa is a paradox uh, by itself because uh, if we compare that experience with ads and the, the, the good outcomes then, and a, a few years and months ago with COVID, South Africa uh, stood up uh, to, uh, to question the Western ed when it comes to... Um, uh, medicines and vaccines, uh, you know, against the COVID. Um, how, how do you explain uh, that um, South Africa did not want to build from the past success successes on AIDS and decided just to uh, um, to deny any efficiency to the Western AIDS when it comes to the COVID, for example, COVID policies? Yeah. No, I think the danger is I'm, I'm going to get into a discussion on foreign policy. Um, <laughs> Because I think that there's, there, there have been a lot of developments yeah. in South Africa regarding its global positioning and its posture towards the West mm -hmm. um, and a growing populism that, that has crept into establishment politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, that very much was part of it. So with COVID, you know, this kind of um, reflexive uh, anti-Western... Uh, view that 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 took hold. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there were some possibly legitimate questions that were being asked mm -hmm. about why don't we enable some productive capacity in South Africa and elsewhere. Uh, you know, South Africa is well capable of producing vaccines, mm -hmm. not necessarily with the IP to um, develop them, but certainly once developed to roll out the production. We have some very sophisticated pharmaceutical operations in the country, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But those are, are more nuanced questions. I think, generally speaking, it relates more to the sort of drift that the uh, ruling party in South Africa has away from the West and towards uh, uh, the sort of BRICS uh, alignment, mm -hmm. and especially with Russia and China, mm -hmm. yeah. and even Iran lately. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Bill, we understand that aid is not an innocent thing. Uh, it's uh, strongly linked to uh, uh, foreign policy. Um, and I would like to ask you about uh, the state of uh, the neoliberal um, economic reforms um, in Africa, because um, we know that the Bretton Woods institutions, for example, from the World Bank to IMF, has linked um, the support, the financial support to economic and structural reforms in Africa. Um, is it still the case uh, or has something, has anything changed uh, about the Washington consensus? Yeah, so I'm not always sure what neoliberalism means exactly. <laughs> it's something like, uh, maybe something like liber liberalism with a dose of coercion applied. <laughs> uh, so uh, the bad part of, of the Washington consensus was that it was a Washington consensus that it seemed to be imposed from Washington through World Bank and IMF conditionality. And that, I think, actually delayed the ad, uh, onset of economic pro-market economic reforms in Africa because of the backlash against that, that, against that coercion. Uh, but what actually happened was that I think that there emerged a kind of homegrown consensus Towards, towards economic reform. Let me give you a, one specific example. When I first joined the World Bank in 1985, my first trip was to go to Ghana. At that time, Ghana was just recovering from a disastrous period in which uh, inflation had been in the triple digits. The, there were severe controls on all aspects of the economy. If you looked at, at many objective measures, Ghana was as tightly controlled as an Eastern European Soviet-style e economy. And the, you know, the black market premium on foreign exchange was above 2,000%. The cocoa exporters that had been the lifeblood of the economy were getting something like 6% of the world price for cocoa, and cocoa had, was dying and had almost died in, in Ghana. And then what happened was not so much the imposition of anything from Washington, but Jerry Rawlings in Ghana, who had been a proponent of extreme controls, 
he decided with some other advisors that this was disastrous and something better had to happen. He started moving towards economic reforms. And you know that was sort of the beginning of what later emerged as a more democratic consensus in, in Ghana after it transitioned to democratic rule. And we started getting the input of great Ghanaian economists like my colleague Yao and Yarko at, at NYU. And so it's more, it emerged as more of a homegrown process, or a way, a, a sort of reaction against the extreme controls that had been so disastrous, these kind of controls like I just described in Ghana. And in fact, that was very precisely timed to the revival of the Ghanaian economy. Every, every, that was the turning point uh, with, with those reforms in the 80s was the turning point that uh, changed the whole picture from negative growth in Ghana to steady positive growth ever since then. And I think that's the larger story of, of Africa. And I think, you know, in contrast with some of the gloom and doom, understandable gloom and doom that we all feel about today's situation, I think this is a much happier long run trend, the movement towards more economic freedom in Africa and some movement towards more political freedom in, in Africa. And that is, in a way, as momentous as the fall of the Berlin Wall was and the end of Soviet communism. It's like the, the end of development planning and the end of extreme state controls to promote development, which was being pushed by the development community before the, before the mid-1980s also. So the, the sort of the whole mindset of development sort of shifted from this sort of planning state, state intervention kind of model to a much more freer model that I think also was very much demanded by, by everyday, everyday citizens. So that's, that's sort of the happier story about, about neoliberalism. You know, if I think of an example of uh, elsewhere in the African continent, uh, the, the famous event of the street vendor in Tunisia, Mohamed Bouaziz, who set himself on fire in protest mm. against the policewoman confiscating his fruit and his scales and slapping him in the face. And later, his, uh, after his death, his mother said, you know, he was just, his, his sense of dignity had been violated. And that, that was what led to his outrage and his protest. And his brother later said, you know, what his example shows is the poor also want the right to buy and sell. They simply want the right to buy and sell. Mm -hmm. they, they want that elementary dignity of being able to participate in markets. So I think it's a mistake to think of market reforms as something imposed from outside. I think it's something that is very much an indigenous, reflecting indigenous demands for greater, greater freedom, both in the economic sphere and in the political sphere. Um, what do you think, because we have mentioned the experience you have from the World Bank and um, the, the role of the Bretton Woods institutions in the Washington consensus. Um, what do you think about the aid provided by the NGOs, uh, meaning uh, humanitarian assistance um, in hotspots? Um, areas of crisis in Africa, um, like Eastern DRC, for example. This kind of assistance, is it the right answer um, to provide to situations of, of strong crisis like this? We, we, we heard this past years how NGOs have been questioned uh, their presence in some of these areas. How, how do you um, assess the situation? You know, um I think this, this is also very related to the dignity theme of aid. Does the aid really respect dignity or not? And certainly refugee camp situations with humanitarian aid are, are a big case of that. You know, the great uh, Ugandan uh, historian and public intellectual Mahmoud Mamdani um, has written about his own experience in a refugee camp when he was uh, as a refugee from uh, Idi Amin's Uganda when uh, Amin confiscated the, the property of, of the East Indians in, Uga in Uganda. He himself was a refugee, and he wrote really memorably about his own experience, which is a voice we sel very seldom get to hear. So it was really valuable that Mahmoud Mamdani could reflect. And he's himself commenting on the, the dignity of refugees. So he said, you know, they took from us everything, but you know, the one thing we were never going to give up was our self-respect. You know, when the refugee camp was telling them with 24, with 12 hours notice, we're going to move you from this camp to that camp, and they, he protested and organized the resistance, you know, that we have the right to be notified to, in a timely manner before we transfer. It's such a tiny thing about that that we'd never even get a, a moment's notice in designing refugee aid. 
You know, that's the kind of thing that I think we too often aid officials forget, that aid is not only about material poverty and material suffering in the midst of a refugee situation, it's also about dignity. And his ability to kind of voice, voice the need for dignity and aid is sort of the kind of thing that really inspires me about the, the future. The future. Not, not, aid does not inspire that kind of hope, but uh, the, the homegrown efforts to protest for greater dignity, whether it be Mahmoud Mamdani or um, Mohammed Bouaziz in Tunisia, you know, lighting the spark that, that led to the Arab Spring, you know, that's the kind of inspirational homegrown demand for freedom that I get inspired by. And, and precisely, uh, uh, from individuals uh, to our states, aid policies are uh, on, on the line in Africa. And uh, I remember a few months ago when, Burk when France decided to suspend its aid to Burkina Faso. Um, and the, the junta, the military leader said, we don't care. I mean, we can do without you. We can cope with the situation because your aid has not been very efficient uh, to our countries for, for decades now. So aid used as a tool for sovereignty um, from in, in the Sahel uh, now. Uh, we also remember uh, when in Sudan, um, the Prime Minister Hamdog has been uh, removed from the power by the military too. And the military said, um, these structural reforms, they are, um, even if we have some aid and assistance from uh, IMF or World Bank, the cost uh, for the people is too high. That was the excuse the military found to remove Hamdok from the power. So how do you, uh, what is your opinion about uh, these statements coming from uh, these uh, countries um, questioning um, it as a tool, uh, as an anti-tool for sovereignty of these nations? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. I think there's always a concern and, and, and that's been there for decades about, about how much uh, the conditions, especially if the conditions are very pervasive, very restrictive, how much they impact national sovereignty. So that's, that's, that's a concern that's been there for a long time and often it's valid, uh, you know. So, so there they has to be, I mean, in an ideal situation, there has to be negotiation of the terms to, to the degree possible, so that so that key aspects that are central to to the development agenda of countries are taken into account. Mm -hmm. So that concern can be there, and sometimes there's uh, sovereignty is affected when there's a lot of imposition of conditionalities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but at the same time, also one has to be careful because also uh, sovereignty issues can become an excuse. Yeah, <laughs> uh, can become an excuse for imposing autocratic rule. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, autocratic regimes sometimes can can invoke sovereignty arguments to say that that uh, well, uh, you know, uh, our sovereignty is being is being infringed, and so now we necessitate sort of cutting links. Whereas sometimes the issue is that their management of of state affairs is being questioned mm -hmm. by some of the countries, for example. With, uh, with which they have uh, uh, bilateral relations. So I think you need a balance, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when, when, when you're looking at that. But uh, ultimately, the, what's central, and, 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 and I think I emphasized this before, is that uh, aid has to be able to support long-term development outcomes. In some of the countries you mentioned, for example, a big challenge is that, is that um, there are typical examples of where you have, uh, you know, insecurity, uh, probably arising from from uh, the fact that development outcomes are not properly met, and then and then that insecurity itself tends to worsen the 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 uh, development outcomes. So you have a mutually reinforcing negative cycle. So I think I think it's very important to realize there is a nexus between security and development, and so you want to promote development outcomes, particularly the ones related to, to human capital development, health and education. I think those are very central for dignity, mm -hmm. but also for, for long-term productivity and, 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 and for long-term innovation. Mm -hmm. So I think those have to be upheld. So if the regime is just simply critical, uh, uh, you know, based on, on, on 
let's say, sovereignty arguments, but at the same time is not able to provide, you know, critical levels of education, health, uh, you know, then that makes the argument sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes less valid. So I think one has to analyze that, that um, yeah. uh, carefully. This is not the only paradox uh, when it comes to ed, and uh, I, I would like um, to, um, to continue uh, this idea with you, Ray, by asking you a question about uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, this is a paradox because I, I remember um, a few months ago when we mentioned um, Western support to Africa. Um, Ukraine was everywhere, and it seems that uh, for the NGOs, Ukraine, the, the Western assistance for Ukraine disrupted the financial commitments um, from the West to African countries. Uh, it's also a paradox because on, on one hand, we don't want that aid anymore, but on the other hand, when Ukraine is there, it's, it's, uh, it's less for African countries. So um, is it the problem or uh, do West, Westerns should make a choice between Africa and Ukraine? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, for Africa, just uh, to, to generalize, I mean, I think that the, there is a, you know, the world is very distracted. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of other crises. There are a lot of other looming crises. Yeah, or Gaza or, um, yeah. And, and Africa is not top of mind in the way that it, it once was when it comes to, to aid. So, you know, there's a message in that which, I mean, I think Africa, Africans have to actually start looking beyond aid and looking at, at doing things which, which have started to happen. For example, the Africa Free Trade uh, Agreement and so on. But I, I do think there is still the question of where does, where is the investment going to come that's going to enable these, not just the, the, the social development, but the economic development. So, for example, African free trade area um, is often seen as, well, you know, uh, there are internal markets for African goods, which I think is part of it. But there's also a supply chain side to that. There's an enormous potential now to have the scale uh, to build continent-wide um, value chains, which might boost exports and start dealing with this problem that, that Africa has had in developing its productive sector to a point where it can start earning serious foreign exchange, exporting, and start man, you know, manufacturing and re-industrializing or industrializing. So that, that potential is there, but the problem is that the, the capital needed for that, whether it's aid, grants, um, or investment, is increasingly in short supply because of the demands of these other theaters. Uh, and it's, 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 it's a real problem because the opportunity is now better than ever. I think I agree with uh, what, what Prof is saying, that there is on the ground a much more open uh, and a readiness to actually start looking at this question of uh, economic development, economic growth um, on the continent, but the resources to empower this are scarce. Um, thank you. I think we are uh, we we reach we are reaching the end of this conversation. Uh, very very uh, exciting conversation. Thank you. Um, thank you, William. Thank you, Ray and uh, and Robert uh, for uh, your um, your thoughts on this. Uh, not one paradox of it, but obviously uh, many paradoxes. Uh, we understand that. Africa needs to see beyond ed and is looking beyond ed uh, through uh, industrial transformation, um, new projects like the FTA, even the transfers from, from immigrants, you know, uh, but also dignity, right? So on that, with that, uh, I would like to thank you again and um, over to the next panel. Thank you. <laughs>